Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you say if you can't at any time. Um, I hope that this is going to be um, a fairly in informal um, experience. I'll talk for a bit, but I hope that we'll have a genuine conversation if we can. We've got about an hour together, and I hope that at least half of that, or even a bit more than half of that, can actually be um, questions, comments, or my favourite, which is comments very thinly disguised as questions. Do you know what I mean? So you basically have a little rant and make your point of view, and then you like lift your voice at the end of the sentence as if you're French or Australian or something, or you say, don't you think? Um, because um, this is really about a framework for debate. It's about a framework for rubbing along together in the world and engaging with some of the most difficult issues facing the world, and in particular, your your generation. So as you've heard, my name is Shami Chakrabarti and I'm the director of Liberty. I've been doing this job for, um, for 12 years, um, but I won't be doing it for, for much longer because I uh, announced last month that this will be, this is my last year and I'll be standing down later this year when a, when a successor is appointed. So, so <coughs> excuse me, um, I should also say that um, one of the best things that ever happened to me is that the Sun newspaper once called me the most dangerous woman in Britain. Yeah. I think I should get a standing ovation for that. What's the problem? No, 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 no. That was a joke. That, that was a joke. The, the funny thing, it's a great icebreaker. You go up and down this country and you speak to different audiences, young and old. <coughs> Excuse me. But the closer you get to the great city of Liverpool, the bigger the applause you get when you say the Sun newspaper called me the most dangerous woman in Britain. And if you don't know what I'm getting at after this, <coughs> go and Google Liverpool Sun newspaper and you will realise that there's a very, very interesting history there uh, that's to do with the Hillsborough football stadium disaster and the way in which um, the newspaper misrepresented that the innocent football fans who were who, who were killed in a, in a terrible crowd control incident. But yes, yeah, so I was once called the most dangerous woman in Britain, I suppose because human rights are about speaking up on behalf of the vulnerable against the powerful, and it's not always to everyone's taste. It's not always convenient, right? It's not easy to do. It's quite powerful stuff to be telling some of the most powerful people in the country and in the world that their power needs to be held to account on behalf of everyone, ordinary people, including children and refugees. We don't call them refugees anymore, do we? We call them migrants, right? Standing up to powerful interests in this country and around the world on behalf of the vulnerable. Trying to prevent abuses of power. That is, for me, what human rights work is all about. Whether you do it as a lawyer or a journalist or a teacher or whatever you do, um, it's about holding power to account. So this happened some years ago that I was called the most dangerous woman in Britain. And I kind of rather enjoyed it, as you can imagine. You go up and down the country talking to people, going, be afraid, be very afraid. You are listening to the most dangerous woman in Britain. But all good things come to an end and everyone gets a bit older. And last year, during the general election campaign, the Daily Mail newspaper decided that that title should actually be given to someone else, to a charismatic politician in Scotland called Nicola Sturgeon, who is now the First Minister of Scotland. And the Daily Mail decided that she's the most dangerous woman in Britain. And of course, she's the Prime Minister of Scotland. And you know what? She's even a little bit younger than me as well. Ouch. <laughs> Enough about me. Why don't I tell you a little bit about Liberty, the National Council for Civil Liberties. It was founded in 1934, um, almost exactly 82 years ago. I can feel the yawns coming on right now. Don't worry, this won't be too much of a history lesson. So, 1934, 2016, two dates that couldn't have less in common, right? Such a long time ago. It's practically no TV, let alone CCTV or reality TV. Um, no DNA had not been discovered. So there certainly wasn't the capability that there is now to take DNA for, from everyone who's been arrested of a criminal offence, whether they're charged or not. And get this one. In 1934, 
no internet. <laughs> Mum, the Wi-Fi's down. <laughs> no internet. My own son, who's nearly 14, finds that absolutely impossible to believe. Because the internet, of course, is an innovation equivalent to the printing press, right? I, I literally believe that the internet is a revolution as big as the printing press was in its day. And it has enormous capacity for good, for education and information and democracy and progress. But of course, it has its darker side too, right? Because there's also the potential for enormous intrusions into your privacy, whether it's by the state or by corporations or by each other. When putting up, people are putting pictures up from that party on Saturday night that you didn't agree to on the internet because everyone's got a smartphone and it's easily done. You need to watch out for that. Um, so that's the yin and the yang, the good and the bad of the internet. And you are the experimental generation. It will settle down in the end and will come to navigate this territory, but just be a little bit smart about it in the, in, in the meantime before it settles down. That's my grumpy middle-aged woman's advice to you. So 1934, a world away. And some things are different, but some things are not different enough. So for example, in 1934, it was a time of great inequality, great economic uncertainty, austerity. In 1934, the far right were on the rise in the East End in London and all over Europe. And there were clashes between you know, the far right and other people, including members of minority communities. In 1934, there had been one great war and another was brewing. And there were too many people suffering the consequences of war, including mental health problems and poverty and all the things that happen after the war. And in 1934, there were already refugees coming to this country from other parts of Europe. And certain newspapers were regularly running front page headlines about how terrible that was. That would never happen today, would it? Would it? But the particular, the particular trigger for the formation of my organisation was that hunger marchers, demonstrators who had no jobs and were worried about their families and shelter and food and so on, marched all the way from the north of England to London's Hyde Park. And they assembled in Hyde Park and they were duffed up by the Metropolitan Police. And the particular device that was used by the police at that time was that some plain clothed police officers dressed as hunger marchers and they went amongst the peaceful throng and they behaved violently, deliberately to trigger and justify a violent policing response. And that, 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 that method is called agent provocateur. Those of you who are French scholars will know that, what that means, right? So um, that would never happen today, would it? Would it? Mm, like a, some people think yes, some people think no, some people don't want to say. Because it's difficult stuff to talk about, isn't it? If you think it would not happen today, I ask you to remember my friend and our great national treasure, perhaps the greatest race equality campaigner this country has ever known, Doreen Lawrence. Have you heard of Doreen Lawrence? She's now the Baroness Doreen Lawrence, and she's sitting in the House of Lords. But even more importantly, she's been in Marks and Spencer's commercials, right? So, so Doreen's story is that well over 20 years ago now, she was a South London housewife, and her son Stephen got murdered by a gang of racist thugs. Right? Is it coming back to you now? Are some of you beginning to seeming a bit familiar to some of you? And Stephen got murdered, and the Metropolitan Police didn't properly investigate. 
and there was subsequently a public inquiry that demonstrated that they didn't care that much because he was black and not white. And there were findings from a public inquiry that there was something they described as institutional racism in this country. That in too many important public institutions like the police service, people's lives were of different worth according to their race. That's not me, that was Lord um, McPherson's findings in the Lawrence inquiry. And that inquiry wouldn't have even happened if Doreen hadn't launched an incredibly important campaign for justice, not just for her own family, but for everybody else's families too. And, you know, I, I think it's extraordinary. I mean, can you, we all know that loss and grief is part of life, but it's not supposed to happen in the natural order of things that a parent loses a child, right? We're all brought up to know that it's not a nice thing to think about, but we'll lose our grandparents and then we might you know, lose our parents. But to lose a child is not, is not supposed to happen. And to go through, can you imagine going through that grief and that loss and not just putting your head under the duvet, but going, no, there will be justice. Something good will come of this terrible tragedy. And that's what Doreen did. And we should all be incredibly grateful to her. She's a legend. However, why her story is relevant to mine is that just a few years ago, we found out as a result of investigative journalism that at the time that Doreen began her campaign for justice for her family, not only were the police not investigating the suspects, those suspected of Stephen's murder, they were investigating Doreen instead. Sorry, there's a bit of an echo, but I don't really know what to do about that. Um, so they started investigating Doreen because she was embarrassing the police. You know, she was campaigning in Parliament, in the papers, etc. And she became really annoying to the, to the police. And so they put undercover police officers in her friendship circle, in her family, in her home. Yeah? Imagine what that feels like. That was just 20 years ago, not 82 years ago. And so whenever you hear a politician or a senior police officer say, nothing to hide, nothing to fear, have you heard that before? Like when they want blanket surveillance powers, they want to scoop up everybody's data on the internet just in case, and they'll sift it and look at it afterwards. And they say, nothing to hide, nothing to fear. The innocent have nothing to fear from unchecked surveillance powers. Just remember my friend Doreen Lawrence. Just remember the hunger marches. And remember also the, the, the women in Greenpeace. Does, do, you, do any of you know the story I'm going to tell you now? So again, not so many years ago, probably even 10 and a bit years ago, there were these women who were in the environmental movement. Okay, these were not jihadis, these were radical vegetarians, right? The worst thing that they're going to get done for is possession of some bad broccoli or quinoa or something like that, okay? These are not dangerous women. And they go to um, Greenpeace meetings and they make friends and they um, make friends with some, some, some men. And in some cases, they form friendships, intimate relationships, partnerships. In some cases, they have children together. And the relationships last up to seven years. And then the guy disappears, and years later, they find out that this was actually not a fellow environmentalist. This was an undercover police officer from the special demonstration squad. That really happened. There are court cases about it. There are newspaper articles about it. You, you can read it. Now, I don't say this to scare anybody. I just say this because we need checks and balances, because there should be lawful surveillance. There should even be undercover police officers, but there need to be checks and balances. Here's a strange thing. In this country, if you want to search somebody's house or their office or their school, you go to a magistrate and you get a warrant. 
to demonstrate that there's a real um, suspicion that something's going on, okay? And then, and then the police can come and search. If you want to tap somebody's telephone, you go to a politician, you go to the Home Secretary or the Foreign Secretary for a warrant. I prefer the judges myself because I think they're more independent of, of politics, but nonetheless, you have to do that if you want to tap someone's telephone. But if you want to put an undercover police officer in somebody's community, in somebody's friendship circle, in somebody's home, in somebody's bed, no external warrantry whatsoever. And I think that's wrong. And I think that we should have more checks and balances. And you don't have to be against security to believe in liberty and human rights. Look, the next really important moment in my story, fast forward from 1934 to after World War II. You know, we had Holocaust Memorial Day last week. After the Holocaust and the Blitz, People from all over the world, people slightly to the left of politics, slightly to the right of politics, members of all the great world religions and people who don't believe in God at all, decided that there needed to be a framework of values that all human beings could share. And that was the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Just a, a basic set of values that everyone could agree on as necessary for civilization so that people don't have to keep resorting to war and barbarism and killing each other. And that's Eleanor Roosevelt in the US, it's Winston Churchill in the UK and people all over the world. And, that, and from that you get your European Convention on Human Rights and more recently our Human Rights Act. That is, it's great to have statues, it's great to have moments of silence and to remember the dead, but we need to honour their legacy in our lives actively as well. And for me, that is about protecting your rights and freedoms and your Human Rights Act. So what's in there? The right to life. That is not the right to everlasting life, you understand. You have to go to a cleric or, I don't know, a, a medic for that. Lawyers and politicians can't deliver that, but it's positive prote protection of life and it's the right to a proper investigation into any untimely death. Right now, my colleagues are conducting an inquest um, in relation to the deaths at Deep Cut. Have you heard about this? You may have heard on the radio this morning or whatever. Deep Cut was a barracks, a military barracks, where for a five-year period, young um, men and women who were training to join the army died in mysterious circumstances. And there was never a satisfactory um, answer to the, you know, the mysterious nature of some of these deaths. And because the Human Rights Act creates a positive right to investigate untimely death, the parents of these kids 20 years later have now got a proper inquest into what happened. Were people bullied? Were people killed? What was going on at that barracks? Because you know, human rights are for everybody not just people who are popular, not just, um, you know, not just British people or, 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 or men or women or, you know, they're, they're for everybody. And that's every person detained in Iraq and that is for every soldier who served in Iraq. They're for everybody. The trick is in the word human, human rights, not British rights or American rights or French rights, human rights, and that is what is at stake in the current debate in this country. And then there's the right not to be tortured or subject to inhuman and degrading treatment. And that doesn't just mean being rendered or being in Guantanamo, that also means children that suffer abuse. That means anything that we understand as torture and degrading treatment. The right not to be enslaved. That seems a bit old fashioned. Surely we don't have slavery anymore. We haven't had it for hundreds of years. Well, actually we do. There are trafficked and vulnerable people, even in this country, even in this city, still living as slaves. There's the right not to be detained without law. There's the right to a fair trial, which includes the right to access to legal advice and representation, something that is so difficult to get these days. The right to respect for your privacy, 
your private life, your family life, your home, your correspondence, we talked about that. It's not an absolute right. Of course you have to have investigations. Of course you have to share information for all sorts of reasons. But it should be necessary and proportionate and in accordance with law and checks and balances. Then there's freedom of thought, conscience and religion. Incredibly important. That is the right to the faith of your choice the right to have no faith at all, if that is what you choose. And I think, most importantly of all, the right to be a heretic or a dissenter within any faith community. Yeah? Because that's how belief systems move on. Yeah? The right to be, I don't know, a, um, a scientist hundreds of years ago within the Catholic Church who says, no, actually, gravity works like this. Or, or the right to be... I don't know, a gay Muslim or a woman in the Church of England who wants to be a bishop or whatever. I think that's really important to, to freedom of faith and conscience, the, the right to mix it up. Freedom of speech and expression and protest. Again, it's not an absolute right. If I stand up here and start inciting a riot, I'm sure that the you know, the deputy head will be twitching again and will be more than twitching. I'll be, you know, I'll be escorted out. But, but, and, and that's quite right. But if I'm just rude or annoying or even swear a bit, yes, I should be escorted off the premises, but perhaps not prosecuted. You know, I really believe that um, there is no right not to offend. No, it's not a duty. It's not, it's not good practice in life to run around offending people for the sake of it, right? It's not, it's not the way to make friends. It's not the way to persuade anybody of, of anything. But we do have to have the debate. That is what Democrat, democratic people do. And there is no such thing as no platform in an internet age. So we need to, to deal with extreme speech by counter speech. We have to have open debate in safe spaces like a school or a sixth form college. Then there's freedom of association and the most important human right of all, in my view. Do you have any idea what that might be? I've been through all this list of torture and slavery and arbitrary detention. Speech. You talked about expression. No. I, that's very important, I, but I've mentioned that. Does anybody have an idea of what I think is the most important human? Education's important, that's for sure, but it's not what's on my mind right now. Speech, speech you're all saying, oh, interesting. Speech is a popular one, good. I'm looking forward to your speech in just a moment. Yeah. No, my, my, my favorite human right, come on, it's just subjective, isn't it? We've all got our views. My favorite human right, and the one that I think is the most important, is equal treatment. So lawyers call it non-discrimination and humans call it empathy. Not that lawyers aren't humans, you understand. Now why do I say that that's the most important human right? Do you have any idea? I'll tell you. Because I think if we really practiced empathy, like treating other people as you'd like to be treated, there would be no torture. There would be no slavery, there would be no unjust intrusions into people's speech and privacy. Because in my experience of doing this work for a long time, because I'm very old, I'm older than Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> Ouch. In my experience of doing it, whatever you read in the papers, whatever you hear on the radio and see on TV, everybody loves human rights. Their own, right? And those are of their friends and their family and people like them. It's other people's human rights are a little bit of a problem. And so the language begins, you know, migrants, not people, et cetera, et cetera. So the beauty of this principle of equal treatment or non-discrimination is it forces people to imagine that that's them. It's them washed up on that beach. It's them in Calais with the bulldozers and the tear gas and the barbed wire, right? And it's, it, it, forces, it forces that empathy because it's too easy to sacrifice the other. One of the greatest um, lawyers and judges of my lifetime was a man called Lord Bingham, um, Tom Bingham. And he spoke at Liberty's 80th um, conference. So, you know, 
uh, no, sorry, 75th conference. That's, that's, that's some years ago now. That's like seven years ago. And he um, spoke about all the different rights and freedoms as, as I have done, you know, torture, slavery, fair trials, free speech, privacy, and so on. And he ended by saying, which of these rights would you choose to discard? Are any of them unnecessary, superfluous, un-British? There may be some people who want to live in a country where these rights are not protected, but I am not of their number, nor am I. Thanks for listening.